All right, hey guys, I think I'm live now. Um, thanks, for, yeah, I, I think I found it. Are we live? Hello, hello, it says live. All right, yeah, we're on. All right, thank you. Instagram changed all the settings and, and uh, oh my God, I was trying to figure out how to go live. They did this back in the beginning when we started this, they weren't recording and then they started recording stuff. Oh my God. All right. Glad you guys are making it. Uh, yeah. Last week I couldn't get on. Um, was down. I had to go down to California. Yes. Secret stuff happening. You will hear about it very soon. Should be cool. Um, anyways, Wanted to tell you guys real quick, I'm listening, right now I'm listening to Death Cab for Cutie, the blue EP, because uh, we're going to bring Jason on, the drummer, he's going to come in, he's a great guy and lives right here in Bellingham, but um, I wanted to tell you guys about, the, so our show here, Happy Hour, brought to you by Herb Cider, where you don't need to put your pants on. Um, we can go deliver cider right to your house. Don't need your pants on either. I don't know why I keep saying it, but I like it. It's a good little tag. Uh, yes. Leave your pants off. Cider delivered right to your home. Um, go to herbcider.com. And, uh, we've got some stuff. We just, Chris, our amazing cider maker, just won a platinum medal from SIP Magazine for our Grand Cuvée, and um, it's called the Concerto, so it will be available on the website next week, you guys, got to check it out, it's award-winning cider, uh, we have a few of those actually, go to our website, you can check it out, um, herbcider.com, and um, let's see, it's... Yeah, it's similar to one of Shama's favorite called the uh, Syncopation. I don't know if any of you guys remember, but it was a crab apple wine. This thing was aged in these big giant... Sorry, guys. Um, anyways, we got these big giant... They're called Foders, big wooden cognac barrels from Cognac, France. And um, we've got a couple of those, and we've got some like regular barrels that had cognac in them for 40 years and then the cognac was taken out and then uh, Chris aged cider in it and uh, it's pretty amazing so we've got that coming up uh, we've got another collaboration between Archibald James cider and Snowdrift cider and um, that is called the better together blend and that is coming out very soon as well. Uh, coming out before Thanksgiving, which is very, very soon. <clears throat> and we're also releasing the Hop Cranberry, which will be a good Thanksgiving treat. Um, this is the first cider for our ALS, the sister project for Ales for ALS. Ales, as in beer ales. So check them out at uh, als.net. So uh, yeah, the week come to our website before the week before Thanksgiving, and you can pick up stuff at our production um, or online for you know local delivery if you guys want to come in if you're in town or nearby. So let me see. Um, yeah, that's what's going on with the cider world, and. Uh, I was able to get our buddy, Jason McGurr. Where are you, dude? Come on, Jason McGurr, Jason McGurr. Are you there? Are you there? I don't see you yet. Send me a, uh, hey Jason, send me a thing. So, let me see, is he there, is he there? Ah, he just texted. <laughs> I'm going to tell him yes, so he, he can get on. Um, <clears throat> so Jason's a, an amazing drummer of Death Cab for Cutie. Uh, some of you might know the band. 
But one of the song, hold on, I gotta play this song that knocked me out when I first heard it. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm trying to get to it, trying to get to it. And watch to see if he comes on, because we gotta bring him on. Let's see where it is, where is it? Yeah, de- okay, here it comes. Okay, this is called The New Year. So when I heard this song, let me crank it up. <clears throat> the drums just blew me away. I had no idea what was going on. Like, it's so creative. Here it comes. Oh, there he is. Bringing him on. Jason's coming on. I did. I'm sorry. I went to I went to your own personal IG. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. This is Jason. And let's so see. I had Jason and when we first started these back in was it March? Maybe I don't know. Something like that. When this pre pre COVID pre shutdown, right? <clears throat> Yeah, right before the shutdown, we started doing these Instagrams, or I think right after. And Jason was like either the first or second guy I had on. But Instagram didn't record um, any of these shows. So uh, that's why I really wanted to have you come back on so people could get to hear what we, you know, hopefully we'll be able to talk about some of the stuff we talked about before. And, uh, yeah, so thanks for coming on. Of course, man. And for, for people that don't know, we're like, we're in the same town. <laughs> we're both, yeah, we're, we're locked yeah. down in the same town. So I got to come like over. Five yeah. miles apart. Oh, you did get a cider. I All did. Right, so I, I, was, got... I was texting with him like, hey, man, let me drive some cider over to your house so you no, have some. I have a supply. I always have a supply. Oh, uh, my God. Life, you're I crazy. Enjoy it. Uh, this, uh, tonight I'm doing Black Note. So last time it was a Ooh, yeah. double stroke. So okay, yeah, we got we just canned some black note. We got some new labels coming out, um, and which they kind of look like this, if people can see. So it's it's like photos from those old things we used to do, live shows. Oh, sick! Yeah, so it's like that's a, a shot great from the audience, cake. and that's a stage with all the light, our lighting. And I think these are actually from some of our Primus shops, maybe. I don't know. Killer. Our art guy. If I can get a better. You're crooked. Better you're, you're sideways now. It My sideways? Work. I'm yeah, sorry. They don't, they, because don't, they don't change their cameras. It's because I, I went with the iPad instead of the. Uh... Oh. Here right. we go. How's that? Right. Good? Yeah, yeah. It looks great. Right. Yeah, you Solid. look so freaking professional with all your drums back there. It just so happens, you know, that they're that they're there. We could <laughs> we could pan around the room. There's a I got some there. here too. Look at that. Yeah. Here I can I can do a quick pan. Yeah. Show everybody. I know I love your right. room there, man. It's amazing. So Oh yeah, you gotta tell people that story of that, that little council right there. Dang, yeah. look at this. We you got... are killing it. And then there's some amps and then there's some more drums over there. Oh, I love that room. That's great. And then there's some more instruments here. That's the dog couch. And then that is the current kit that we're tracking with right now. What are you doing? What are you working on? Uh, lots of Death Cab stuff. <clears throat> are you tracking demos? Uh, more than that. Because I know last time you said you don't use your studio that way, but. Yeah, our- well, I think my studio will be used that way. We're, yeah, there, there's some stuff I've been doing here that the world will, will hear. Oh, awesome! That's Death Cab, and um, and I've been tracking for a half dozen or so other artists in the past couple months, really? from kind of all over, everywhere from Seattle to Nashville to New Zealand to, um, I guess Seattle again. But uh, this. 
this whole shutdown thing, I mean, uh, that's been the, the only blessing other than getting to spend a lot of time with my family is typically I would say that I didn't have much time before for doing session work, uh, right. you know, because you go out, as you know, you go out for yeah three, three to five weeks and you come home and, you know, because you're, you're a husband and a dad, the last thing you want to tell your family when you walk in the door from a three or four week tour or five week tour is love seeing you all but i gotta go in the studio and work on a record right <laughs> yeah now, you know totally i know so it's been it's been nice to be home and able to come down and hit record whenever i want oh man i've been doing a, I've been doing a lot of it and i think my yeah. engineering chops are up and uh i feel like i'm getting better at uh recognizing the weak links right there's nothing like truth on tape <laughs> oh my God. What good at and what you're yeah what you're not good at oh yeah what you need to work on. I know, I hear you. Wow, that's really cool. Can't wait to hear some of that, man. And that, that's what I wanted to, you know, tell people. I've told you before, but I, I, it's so cool the way you approach the music because <clears throat> from a rhythmic standpoint, you know, your music, the Death Cab, uh, I'm, I'm referencing right now, but it musically, doesn't require anything too crazy so what what you've done is interesting how you can take like uh the idea of okay I, I you know need to make it feel good and sound good but how can you make it interesting and that's so you do that so well it's and and that kind of stuff is a super challenge and i know most people may not be drummers but to be a drummer and you have all these limitations and to still make it like different, interesting, feel good, sound good, and fit with what's going on, man. You're you're the master at that. That's yeah. really cool. Well, yeah. I, more, more and more, I feel like it's the basics are so important, right? Like if you don't have a good sound to begin with, but if you don't keep good time, like quarter notes, eighth notes, like really simple shit, if you're not, yeah. placing, if you're not placing it in a, in a spot that doesn't even need to be in the middle, it just needs to feel good, right? Right. So I, I feel like there was a time, and I know it's the same for you, it's the same for any of the guests you've had or any of, any of the, the drummers that we talk to on a regular basis. Like we go through this crazy cycle uh, throughout our careers of, you know, being inspired by so many different players and some of them are athletes and some of them are total groove pocket symbol players. Right. And I, I've said this before, but I think one of the best things that ever happened to me as a player was uh, getting to play with death cab because none of the guys in the band were on any kind of a pursuit. Like I was in terms of right. trying to be technically proficient or, right. you know, working on independence or all that stuff really helped build a foundation for me. But when I got in a room with them, it was more about just supporting the song and making sure that I never filled over somebody's lyrics, you know, oh, yeah. left space for a really simple guitar figure. And right. I've always been impressed with drummers that have a ton of facility, but even more impressed by those drummers that have facility that don't use it. And I mean, there's right. times when I get to really, you know, drive hard, especially in the live show. Uh, but right. you know, everything I've been doing as of recently has been, um, just being as supportive as possible and remembering that those those chops and those abilities are, are there that I have to you know get the rust off a little bit <laughs> right anyway, like we do what we got to do and and live anything goes I think you throw down you can push it besides what's someone going to turn around in the band and be like don't do that Phil <laughs> yeah Everyone just, everyone's going for it so right I have a really supportive band and uh it's nice when I get called to do session work um that people generally reach out because of enjoying what I already have done, my foundation. Mm. And more and more, they trust you and they just let you go for it. But it's true, man. Oh, cool. Less is more. Less is more. Yeah. And I listen to and I listen to you. Ah. So you know, you've made some seminal albums that have. Helped. Well, no, we have a. Uh, I, that's why I can understand what you're doing is because it's it it is similar to the way I think, which I kind of got. I feel like from Neil Peart, you know, fitting all this coolness within these songs that aren't, it's not like it's jazz fusion, you know, where there's so many notes or they're going crazy, but 
it's tasteful. He makes parts. And, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, here's a cheer to Neil for that. Cheers to Neil. I miss Neil. I know. Tell me about it. I, the one time that um, I had an opportunity, I never met him face to face. I was, I was, yeah, amazingly, they asked me to be part of a documentary, um, which was super well done. Um, and of course, I had a lot to say about both Neil and the band in general. Um, but uh, there was one one time we were playing the Hollywood Bowl. He was in L.A. and I tried like hell to get him to come down and double drum with me on a song called We Look Like Giants. Oh, wow. Basically, the singer and I have, have done this thing historically where we the middle of the song we bring out this little kick snare hat and the two of us kind of face off and oh, do cool. this whole double drum thing and i think neil had heard a um a live recording of that and had sent a message via one of the drum companies like oh dude hey, that's awesome this was amazing you know it was really cool i love that song and i was like do you want to come out like we'll we'll make it easy like whatever you need we'll set it up and right it was, you know him so i mean you, you were fortunate enough to tour with him, and yeah, he, he's a pretty soft-spoken, shy guy most of the time, right? Um, no, well, on tour, I mean, he was he was Neil. He wasn't quiet or anything. Like he would talk right. to you, but he was very much into his own space, his own time, you know. And uh, yeah, so he he yeah he was cool, but that that was that. Um, that idea of uh, composing drum parts in a song, not just playing a beat. Like, and I'm listening to your, I listen, I'm listening to your stuff right now. And I hear you taking, you know, a simple guitar melody, melody and, and finding, you know, your thing that you're doing, but then you're thinking, yeah, like this one, this is great. I mean, so tasteful, and you're and there's parts. You, like you say, you're working around the lyrics, and the hard part. That's the hard part with Primus is, I'm usually the first thing recorded, <laughs> and I don't. There aren't vocals usually, or there aren't any of that stuff. So I'm just kind of imagining in my head, thinking I need changes. I need this is a song. I've got to yeah. have it. When it goes from here, it's got to go to there, or you know, how can I, I always like to take stuff away. That way I have room to do stuff and I, I will remove, you know, rather than an eighth note part, I'll drop it down the quarter yeah. note slowly. I don't like just doing one thing. Even if I'm doing quarter notes, I'll make it an eighth note thing every couple times, you know, or just, so yeah, we have a similar approach. So yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. Maybe listening to me, you might, get that and I, I definitely Neil that's what I got from Neil was the composition. Yeah, I I um there's only been a handful of sort of improvisational, you know, sit down jam night slash I there was a time when I was doing jazz a few nights a week, believe it or not. Um and I always had the hardest time just sitting into improvisational situations not because I couldn't keep time or listen, but because I really wanted to construct parts. Because yeah. like you said, it's it's about this fabric, right? It's about a, uh, a composition, not just your own composition and what you compose, but a composition of the whole piece, right? Like, like when you're looking at a photograph, if there's a bunch of clutter, your eye goes right there. And the same thing happens with your ears as a listener, if there's a bunch of unnecessary shit happening then it could take away from that moment. And it's funny, you said you go first. There have been times when I go first or when we demo as a band, I may send loops or something to Ben or you know, the framework of the song um, and he'll hang parts on it or the rest of the band will. We've been doing a lot of that lately, but okay. I often want to go back in the end because I have said to Ben before, it's easier for me to go after you because I don't want to step on lyrics. Like if you, if, right. if the singer says something more breathy or sings something breathy or with more emotion, uh, or there's a guitar part or something, I need to punch holes through those spots. I need to frame, yeah. I need to underline, right. I need to be off to the side. 
I want to make sure that like, I'm not like bogarting somebody's, you know, like the family photo. Like, I'm not going to be the guy that's like, <laughs> you know, right in there. And I, I think that we have a very powerful instrument, right? In terms of being something that can underline, something that can punctuate, something that can be very forward. And there's times for all of that, right? Right. And uh, I'm, uh, like I said, I'm a fan of yours, obviously. And I think you've done that really well. There's a lot of drummers that have done that well. Yeah, uh, yeah. D despite the music, right? Right, right. That's the thing too, man. There's a lot of great drummers that are just, for me, I just don't want to listen to the music that much, you know? And that's that's another magical thing is to connect with the people where you musically can be in that environment where you can shine and you can, uh, no, let me take that back, not shine, but you can play your instrument and have the music fit with what you're doing. And uh, that's a hard part, you know, you can have a great drummer just doing country or like let's say a country music and he's just a session guy but he, you know he can play amazing shit i don't know is he happy or is he you know is he really doing it all the time that's the one thing for primus i feel like i definitely get the chance to always uh come up with my creativity and put it out there and it can work you know like some of the rhythms you're doing here is like, you know, wouldn't fit in something else. And I, I don't know, man. I, I just think it's like you said, really cool that it, it, it that you found that band, you know, that you can do that, but still you have your area where you have to watch what you're doing and it makes you even more creative, you know? Oh, it's funny. I, I, uh, I did a, I had a Gretsch Generations conversation with Steve Ferroni uh, oh, yeah. about a month ago or three weeks ago. And we were talking about each other's catalogs and I was, you know, talking what about- was the, What was some of the stuff he saw on? Uh, Steve Ferroni started yeah. out an average white band, uh, but uh, I mean, Tom Petty for the last, you know, 20 years. So that oh. Tom Petty record, Wildflowers, he was a big part of that. I mean, okay. Like as a, as a voice, as a footprint, you know, but right. I was, we were talking about catalog and first time we heard each other and this and that. And the first song he brought up was a song called Transatlanticism where I don't, <laughs> I play the back half only and all I play is quarter notes. <laughs> like, but it's this crescendo you know, and all the way to the end of the song, and I just get louder and louder and harder and harder. And I mean, if you're standing next to my drum riser, the whole thing looks like it's about to collapse. It's like as much gas as I have in the tank gets completely right. used and exhausted every night. But that's that's the approach. That's the technique. That's the part. It evolves over the course of like literally like seven minutes. Right. So, um, but it's funny how people pick up on things that sometimes you, as the guy in the seat, don't think is like as cool or you know like you didn't i mean I'm, i've always been into that part we recorded it and i think i we tracked the song twice or three times and we couldn't do any better than the album version but we you know i always when teaching younger drummers or if i'm in the studio kind of doing a mentor thing with them it's it's so obvious when people get in their head about constructing parts and overthinking things when really they just need to relax and play what's right for the song yeah okay. break it down take away stuff and then see yeah. what you're left with and then see what you can add to make it better because it might not require much like you said yeah and it's <clears throat> i think it's way harder to subtract you know what i was going to ask you actually um so some people know some people don't um i i wasn't the first drummer in death cab um i joined in 2002 so there were three records before i joined the band um, oh and there were three different drummers on those records. Okay. So I had to, you know, put on different hats, but it had to be me when it came yeah, to yeah. parts. And you've had to do the same thing, you know? I have and, actually, yeah. And I, you know, I mean, obviously, Brain's a, a great drummer. You're yeah. a great drummer. But like, for me, I just wanted to say that I, I enjoyed playing other people's parts because it allows me to be sort of a different character. It's like going into the phone booth and like 
spinning right. around and coming out and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not me, I'm somebody else, but I'm me. And I'm just wondering how you approach, you know, when you came back and started, you know. Oh yeah. Well, this is the hard, the hard part is, well, just so everyone know a little <clears throat> Primus history here. Um, so in 88, 89, uh, I heard a Primus demo and that had Jay Lane on it. And I had five songs on it. And that's what I learned when I auditioned and joined the band. Um, and I learned from that. So I had already at that point taken those songs and kind of played them as close as I could because we had, when uh, Primus started, we had one, me and Larry, okay, I auditioned with the original guitar player and Les, and then I got a call, Les says, oh, we got good news and bad news. The good news is we like you and want you to join. The bad news is Todd quit, the guitar player. <laughs> so this is like, okay, now Les is the only original guy in the band. So he brings in his buddy, Larry, and we all got together and then you know, we uh, started making those songs um, as good as we could because they existed already. And Primus was already a fairly well-known band right in San Francisco. You know, they were selling out clubs and doing well. So we had to step in and kind of keep that up. And um, And so those songs, I slowly developed my own approach in them but i tried to play them you know as as close as i could over the years i've definitely found out my things that i like to do and um but then i became the drummer for many years and then you know late mid mid 95 96 is when i left and then brain came in then they did a couple albums so Jay Lane is more of like a, a funk drummer. And his lead hand is a left hand usually. I had to call him because I was learning some of the songs <laughs> on one of the, the Green Naga Hide. And I called him like, you know, I'm doing it, but it, it seems kind of weird. Like, I can't figure out how you're starting, what's going on. And he said, um, he said, you know, oh, that's because I, I usually lead a lot of stuff with my left hand. And being a right-handed drummer, the one falls on the right hand. Well, with him, a lot of it falls on the left hand. So these, these little double notes. And he was a very busy hi-hat guy. Ooh. Same with brain. A lot of brain stuff. Brain's more of a rock and funk and hip-hop and right. jungle. He can do it all. Right. And, um, and so two very different drummers and I'm, I'm having to learn their parts and and I just I just did it actually last week um, we're doing some upcoming Primus stuff that's secret right now so that's classified everybody do not tell everyone on Instagram but I didn't, I didn't sorry you you broke up there I didn't yeah know what you said but I had to play some of brain stuff uh, uh, give it a shot and see how it sounded you know and uh, I ended up like the finding out the difference, you know, is like I ended up doing things my way and just seeing that difference and like, wow, I, I just can't think like he can, you know? Well, and, newsflash though, obviously you, you're only you, right? Like, yeah, I'm sure if you tried to play, if I tried to play the parts too much like <clears throat> the people that track the records before my time, it's not going to feel good to me or the band. So obviously we got to make it our own, but I'm yeah. sure you made it sound and feel great. Yeah, I think it, it I think it uh, sounded good. So, and um, I think uh, everyone should have a chance to find out soon what that was. <laughs> yeah, once again, you broke up. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> So wait a second, I got I got time out here. You actually rehearsed with your band because I haven't been in the same room with my band with the instruments. In yeah, man. So a while flew down, flew down with the mask. The airlines are doing really well. They're keeping people apart. They have HEPA filters in the 
in the cabins now. So they're filtering all the air out. Finally, thank God they didn't do this a hundred years ago, but, and, um, I got down there and kind of kept to myself pretty much, but we, we got tested. We had some rapid tests right there. And so we did testing as we went in and, and then we were all good. And then we just kind of stayed together, you know, during the thing. And I just, I just would like get food and then go back to my hotel and, and that yeah. was it. I stayed away so that I didn't take any risk. Yeah. And everyone, everyone kept to that. So yeah, it How worked did, out uh, well. And, um, did you hold yeah. up? Did you hold up? Were your hands and feet in good shape? Did they keep oh my up God. Their, your I mental was, excitement? I was just so, like, ready for this? No, dude, I was so anxious because <laughs> yeah, I was like, Oh my God, am I going to be able to do it? You know? Right. And, uh, take for granted how much energy it takes to sit in a room with a band <laughs> but i was but i was really like surprised at like how like i it was like wow i i i think i played really well <laughs> you know and like you know, i haven't sat behind the drums for an hour straight you know what i mean i think that's where the mental game takes over like it oh, doesn't man. matter like some of the some of the most memorable shows i've had had been where I'd just flown in somewhere, Southern Hemisphere, like Australia, and just right. been completely wrecked right. uh, and out of my mind. But you're so inspired to touch your instrument and to see people that it's it's that whole thing. You know, the stories about someone's being crushed in a car wreck and and dude comes over and lifts up the car. You know, like that finding human strength, like digging deep. I think that there's a mental. Uh, it's like a scale right it's like we could be super well rehearsed and in badass shape for tour and like mentally not there because we're tired of being on the road or whatever yeah uh, but our body like is there for us so we can perform and it's the other way around our body could be sucking wind because we maybe haven't been playing live for a while or a few months but we're so mentally stimulated that that replaces it i feel like no matter what you're always playing well um, and I'm sure that when you got in the room, you're like, this is the best thing in the world. Like, I feel great. It felt, it, it did feel good, man. It felt comfortable, felt like home, you know, like, okay, this is, this is my world. You know, I've got my kit, everything set. Like, thank God everything's got memory locks. Everything was just set from the last tour we did. And, oh yeah, I just sat there and was like, wow, this is working pretty well you know so yeah we had a good time and we got something uh something happening soon you guys will hear about so sorry you're breaking up I'm yeah sure <laughs> awesome but, um yeah yeah so what what's been going on with you guys so yeah you you haven't been in a room with you guys didn't did you guys do something recently um there the world will hear some stuff before too long uh but we we're also working on a um working on an album we're just writing and writing and demoing and redemoing and and making sure that you know lp10 which is what it'll be for us is going to be a wow. great record and there's no you know we're not uh we're not rushing into it because that you, you can't really tour a record right now so there's no I mean, nothing against, I, I love some of the albums I've been hearing come out, um, but I feel bad for those bands that can't tour them, you know? Yeah. And I I don't want to, um, I don't want to, personally, I don't want to release a record and not be able to go tour it and share it with the world in, in a live sense until we know that that's a real possibility. So until right. then, we're just continuing to make music and, you know, write mostly remotely. Um, um, Oh no, my band just found out that I'm on Instagram right now with you, so I gotta not spill beans. But anyway, um, uh, <laughs> it's just been a lot of recording and a lot of writing, and and we're all honing our engineering chops and making sure that you know we're we're gonna be prepared when it does come time to actually hit record. Well, yeah, there's you know the talk of the uh, vaccines happening pretty soon. That might really step shit up pretty quick if if. One, one would hope yeah it's legit yeah tell me about it it's been um because we're booked already like our manager for the last year has been booking stuff and then they just wait and see what happens and then just okay well we'll move it to next year 
So now he's already got, we've already got a bunch of stuff reserved for this next summer. Cause we're supposed to do this rush thing. And that got punted from like, yeah, like two years ago. Yeah, I know. That's so crazy. We've been, we were just going to do it. This is before Neil passed away. We were going to do something before that. And then it got delayed and then, yeah, Neil died and then we were going to go and then it was postponed again. <laughs> Excuse me. Then it was postponed again. And so now we're still waiting. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's hard. I, I think that the world is dying to see more live. They're dying to see some live music. And well, definitely live shows are going to be totally they're gonna be, what everyone's going to go to. They're going to be off the chain. I mean, yeah. I, I cannot wait. You know, you know, we've all been there where touring is long, it's difficult, it's hard. And sometimes despite a stellar audience and a beautiful setting and room or whatever, it's, it's hard to sometimes be fully present, you know, like in terms of fully enjoy every moment. Yeah. And I don't think that that's going to happen again, <laughs> you know, like in terms of that inability to like just 1000% dig what you're doing. Like I, I cannot wait to get out and play yeah. live again. We we talk about it all the time as a band, and yeah, I mean you can only do so much in a room remotely. Uh, so I think that a lot of people are making great, you know, records right now that the world is going to get to hear and see live that are going to blow their mind. Right. I yeah. That's true. Are you guys working on anything? Nothing new right now. Um. So. That'd be top secret anyway, right? Well, I guess maybe yeah. <laughs> I've been, I, for the, God, for the last year, I've been trying to work on my own stuff. And, uh, cause I just kind of, I like to do, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a more of a rocker guy, you know, <laughs> I like, I, I love like, you know, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains and Who doesn't heavy stuff. And so, yeah. yeah, I've been working on, I've been working, I made a record 13 years ago <laughs> with some, had some great people on that Did called you? Fata Morgana was, um, and with uh, some buddies in Arizona from the band Fred Green and some other guys. I had bass player Tony Levin played on it and my friend Luis Sick. did a bunch of guitar stuff on it. I mean, I just, just emailed them the track and they did their work and send it back it was like amazing that i could do that well, but yeah i've got i've got some guitars there i mess with i got my drums so i just basically you know writing writing singing doing all that stuff i think the more you the more instruments you play the more you can contribute anyway <laughs> did you write any of the music in laundry um no i just did the drums and vocals and that was, yeah, that was my, all the laundry stuff was definitely the first kind of me diving into vocals. And then playing that stuff and singing was fun uh, just because it, I literally was just separating my hands and feet from my voice. <laughs> it was very, Oops. you know, and still Oops. learning where my voice works and doesn't. And so anyways, yeah, it was interesting. So you're mostly writing music right now. You're not. Are you? Are you spending any time practicing like drums? Or are you done I, with that? I just can't. <laughs> uh, every now and then I'll sit for like five or ten minutes and just bang around. I don't know. I just don't. I, I don't get motivated to like like so-called sit and practice like maybe everybody imagines what practicing is. So I would much rather play to some tunes of something. But that's practice, right? Like yeah, it is practice. The practice and then of, then I work on my own composing. stuff. The practice of composing and recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll, I get work on, I'll work on my own songs and try to figure out drum parts that fit and doesn't fit, and and that's that's something too where I find like with it's interesting with my own stuff. I I I don't do what we're talking about. I don't like compose my parts it's so weird like i i sit and i just kind of play through it and then i'm like why doesn't it sound good you know <laughs> it doesn't bothers me so i think i'm learning oh i've gotta i've gotta 
figure out well, the parts, you know. You know what? If, if you're a drummer writing songs, it's sort of the, the equivalent of the plumber who has the leaky faucet, right? Like your own, even though it's your profession, it's not your priority sometimes when you're doing another thing. Yeah, okay. exactly. And that's where I find out I've got to switch hats. You know, I got to take take that off and now think of it as a drummer. Okay, how can I make this good? And they go back to guitar and say, oh, wow, the drum part's cool now. Oh, I should change. I got to change everything I'm doing on guitar now. <laughs> and then, right. oh, yeah, so it, it's crazy. That's what I've been doing. And you, you've been, I, I've, you've been doing, uh, I didn't realize this, that you are uh, a very skilled teacher as well. <laughs> right? To, to some, yeah, no, I'm, uh, I think that here, here's a, here's a perfect example. Um, I had a new student reach out and um, had her first lesson the other day. And I think that with, with every new student or every student these days, we have a very frank conversation up front, which is, what do you want to do? Like, because there is the very tried and true drum teacher that teaches you rudiments and curriculum and independence and you know by the book like we could we could list off all those books all those videos and then there's the there's sort of or the mentor teacher kind of vibe where it's like well what do you want to do do you want to make a living in music which is more and more difficult these days well then we're not just going to work on paradigms like we're going to talk about how to record yourself we're going to talk about i mean like there's drummers on instagram these days that are like marketing themselves as this is how you put together a video, which is good to some extent. But what do you want to do? Do you want to be an Instagram drummer? Do you want to be an album drummer? Do you, you know, do you want to be a band guy? Do you want to be a session guy? Like, what is your goal? And for me, much like you said, you're writing songs, you're thinking about things outside of your drum set, you've really put in the time behind your kit. So it's not as much of a, a inspiration or a priority for you to put time on your kit. So my teaching these days is, has become a lot more broad. Like if someone comes to me and they really want to work on their hands, great, we'll go there. But I'm also going to make sure that they're aware of that that is not, you know, a means to an end. Like just because you can blaze singles or doubles or have all this texture in your technique, that that doesn't impress the songwriter. So what is your goal? You know, do you want to be, who are your favorite bands? Like, where do you see yourself? Yeah. Um, how do you want to present yourself? So today, I think that being a great teacher has more to do with helping somebody realize what kind of a musician they want to be. Yeah, what they're looking at. Yeah, just real quick, people are asking, how can they get lessons? Uh, you can just, you know what? I've been terrible about digging into DM, and uh, I've had some, um, I know that I've let some, student inquires hang but I'm, I'm trying to be better about it so just continue to bug me and on instagram you can dm me and and i'll respond to you i'll, I'll be better i promise oh wow <laughs> it's, really? it's a, i'm trying to juggle between spending time here right working on music and because for me it's like blinders if if i'm working on somebody's track and it's important to me for the you know for the sake of the producer or the artist or you know whether it's somebody unknown or known I don't I don't necessarily prioritize the teaching over that kind of thing some days. But when I'm teaching, that's the most important thing. And the students go long and, you know, this is blowing up or whatever. And I, I'm supposed to be delivering consolidated files and comps to an engineer in Seattle. And I'm, I'm too busy teaching. So I right. to me, it's whatever's right in front of my face is is the most important thing at that time. Um, yeah. I just haven't. The other thing is I don't. Uh, you know, I taught for a long time, about 10 years at Seattle Drum School, and I was super busy. They, you know, people called the school. They booked my lessons. I just showed up and taught. When it comes time to me booking all my own lessons and, like, doing the whole thing and marking myself as a teacher, I kind of suck at that. So right. I'm available. I'm, <laughs> I've been doing it, but I'm just sort of like this strange hermit. Yeah, yeah. The teaching for me, I, I did it a few times. I've done it throughout the years off and on, but... I, I'm, you know, I'm completely self-taught and I just, every time I teach, I feel like I'm not, I don't know, like I'm not giving them the money's worth. It's weird. Shut up, dude. That's it's not weird. what it's about. Look, I know, me, but I, I would rather, 
honestly, I would rather like some of the most I've had some I still take lessons. I still study from random people on a, on a more regular basis. I've been studying with this guy named Stephen McWhorter, who's the 10 time Scottish world champion drummer. Oh, wow. just because his hands are insane and wow. and watching watching him and just the little things that he says, the things that he points out like, hey, you know what you should like last lesson. We were talking about all these rudiments and these complicated flam exercises and he suggested playing them all with no accents. Do all your playing with no accents, just super low to the floor level, no accent playing. Right. And I was like, never thought of that. Like I never really pursued rudimental drumming that way. Right. So his point was that you need to, you need to have control at a really low level, like learn to burn quiet. And I was like, right. light went off. I was like, all right, that's this week's goal. Right. Um, but That's look, cool. all I was going to say cool. is you should never discount yourself. You are a professional that offers so much history as a drummer and life experience. And like, it doesn't matter how much you practice on a pad or your kit or how yeah, many you yeah. roll over. Have you been on tour? Have you played jet lag? Like, <laughs> yeah. you play? you consider this stuff. So a lot of the students I end up having is sometimes professional guys like you who are on tour in said big band and they have an issue, but they don't really know who to talk to about it, you know? So. It's, wow, that's it's, interesting, yeah. You, you'd you be surprised, I think, that no, A, nobody thinks like you think who comes to you for a lesson, I guarantee you. They're just stoked to yes. hear whatever you have to say and all advice is golden. Right, yeah, that's true, man, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've that's one thing I've noticed with when I see drummers and it's like, like you said, you know, there's those athletes and then there's those groove players. And I think one of the biggest thing I found is why I don't spend a lot of time at the kit is because I think at my maximum technically is plenty for any kind of music that I want to play. I don't want to learn how to have each limb doing different things i will never use that and if i did it would be it would just be a little trick i'd be doing for myself because people got to be able to listen to this and sure. it's got to sound cool yeah. and i like music more that has groove but like like the way you do it it's got groove but it's interesting you know you don't you definitely don't need to be those Dennis Chambers to do that, you know? But we have mad respect for him, right? Oh, God. That was my right. first drum clinic. Really? Ever. I'm this, I'm this, you know, I'm kind of getting well known. Zildjian's like, come do this drum clinic. You were paired with Dennis? Oh, my God. I had to play first in front of Dennis Chambers. <laughs> and Thank I you. was so nervous. I was, it, it was the same thing. I was like, come on, dude. Like, what am I going to do? You know? <laughs> but it's that, like you're saying, it's, that's my own head trip. You know, I don't know what I, what I do. I don't really know what I do from an outside perspective. None of us do, yeah. So that's what's hard. <clears throat> but Dennis was my first guy. Wow. Oh, man. my God. I felt like such a, like, oh, God. And then I think I realized I, I might as well not even try. I just I just kind of did primus grooves, you know, rhythms and build it. But into that's like what a, people that's what people wanted to see. Yeah, like, I guess so. Yeah, well, but it was, I, it was we've all heard it. Stay in what, your lane. You yeah, know? and what was like, crazy was Dennis after uh, after like sound check. Dennis came up and was asking me how to not how, <laughs> but. He started kind of mimicking some of my double bass grooves, you know, because he didn't do that. Right. And, and I was like, holy shit, here's this brilliant master at the kit who can play jazz, funk, anything. And he's, and he's totally checking out my thing. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, this is crazy. And then I started getting the understanding of, like, what I do is different. That's how, that's what I'm getting at is, Oh, yeah. I see, you know, like, it's not all one thing, you know, it's, it's, we are different, even though you can be technically amazing, you still, he can still appreciate something simple. Steve Smith did the same thing. 
he was asking me how I do some of the laundry grooves. And I was like, what? You're asking me? Like, and he thought it was so, he was so interesting. So I, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I mean, and th those two guys definitely helped reinforce that. Like, you don't have to be this magician to do some really cool stuff. You can be simple. It's just how, it's how you take those simple tools, you know, single stroke, double stroke, triplets, maybe paradiddles, rarely, but right. I, I might use a paradiddle here and there. It's really singles and doubles, different levels and different combinations. And that's, that is everything in what I do. So, so if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, me. it makes perfect sense. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I get up pretty early in the morning and spend time with sticks every day. It's like the only guaranteed time that I have to, to really, like, really, well, the days are just, I mean, I could carve out more time, but I'd rather make myself available for, you know, whether it's session stuff or my family or, or, or whatever, the, but like the happy hour, her true, happy. the happy hour with Sam. <laughs> uh, but the true focus, like hardcore practice for me is um, in the mornings, like usually between 530 and seven every morning. What? It, it's true. Yeah. Anyone that, that follows, early? anyone that <laughs> you ask a number of drummers, yeah, people, they'd be like, oh, yeah, McGurr's up early. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. But man. it's. Jeez. To me, it's when your brain is empty. Yeah, you know, yeah, I get it. I get about it. everything from the day, and you can really investigate. And it's a lot of it is not super challenging practice. It's like how relaxed can I play? But I'm still waiting. My point is that I'm still waiting. Like I feel like I'm trekking through the desert with nothing but a straight horizon and no signs of life, and I'm always waiting and digging, like investigating for some glimmer you know some little speck of of direction uh, yeah. and for me it's just head down and do the work and i may not play the drum set that day or today i mean today did i i guess i did track some drums today okay but there are days that go by and i don't touch drums or a few days or you know my right. family and i will go out of town we'll go out to the coast or something like that for okay. a week but i still pad it and i still play the drums and or, i mean i still like try and investigate hands what's happening but Right. I've always, I've always felt like if if I stopped, if I ever stopped investigating or trying to look for that deeper level of simplicity and relaxation, that right. that's when I'll be done. That's when it, that's when I'll start to sound like I don't give a shit. You know? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. After I notice after a couple of weeks, if I don't play, I get this like really nervous, almost scared feeling, like do I still know how to play, you know? <laughs> it's weird. Well, it's funny. It, it I, freaks me out, man. I heard once from uh, a, a friend of uh, Jojo Mayer's that he, the guy asked him, um, it was actually Guy Licata, um, who makes the reflex pads. Um, he, I think he asked Jojo, and I hope I'm not betraying any secrets here, but I think he asked him, like why he didn't practice much and his answer was something to to the point of like well i i think about practice you know i think about calibration and how it all fits together i mean i'm totally paraphrasing he was yeah. far more eloquent with with his story but right i think that most of us have that when we sit down we know how to play the drums yeah it's it's not foreign to us how to put together beats and you know groove yeah. and phrasing and everything but the calibration you know, like the right ratios, the right amount of energy, the right amount of relaxation, all that stuff, I think, takes staying on it. Like, right, and right. I even I saw Jojo Mayer recently in Seattle at a club show just before the shutdown. And, you know, he had some moments where it wasn't like perfect. And, you know, he stuck his tongue out and but it was, it was still awesome. Right. Like there was right. nothing you couldn't judge it with anything but pure, you know, wonder. Um, right. But he, I talked to him afterwards and he's like, just not, he even said the word, he's like, I just don't feel calibrated. I just got off a plane. And, and that, that right. has stuck with me ever since that, both that story and speaking with him, like, I think we do need to put in time. Every drummer does, even if it's like 10 minutes a day. Yeah. Um, you, just you, familiarize you yourself with it. Like, like yeah. do the walk, 
right? Yeah. Like, do you know where the light switch is in the dark? How often have you, have, how often have you gone for it? You know, yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, listen, man. Uh, my buddy down in uh, California just gave me the three-minute warning. Somebody's on the show, huh? Not you. I thought you were the boss. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, not really. <laughs> but um god yeah there's 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 uh thank you for coming on there's a yeah we don't have enough time no, i wish no. this was unlimited and we could keep going because i wanted to tell the story of our first meeting well we got three minutes real quick nope. this Do is it. somewhere somewhere mid 90s i'm i flew into seattle we had a show in seattle and guess who's the guy who's coming to pick me up that guy right there the runner and he comes and gets me, and I still have this deep-seated feeling that I was not a nice guy, and I was probably You're just tired grumpy. and grumpy and, yeah, not happy. You're and like I hope a, I wasn't a fucking, a fucking hotel, man. I, I try. I don't think I'm ever really addicted to people, but I might have sounded like it, but, but hey. I hope not. You were fine, and I okay. was fine. There was there was nothing that was offensive about that memory whatsoever, and it was a fantastic show at the same. No, but we. But the reason it comes up is there was something, right? Like you felt like maybe I wasn't. No, I think that I think How that did it we was know? A, I think it was a backline problem. Like we didn't have what you needed, or something like that. Oh, really? Or the hotel room wasn't ready, or like basically we were sponsoring. I oh. think you being there i don't know if it was both a laundry gig and a clinic or something like oh, that. oh it was but that oh okay it was definitely laundry at the sit and spin oh okay oh my god dude thank you yeah okay one minute so yeah that was probably a rough time obviously left primus struggling playing these small clubs exactly no no audience no support. You're like where's catering yeah, there's not. Yeah, I'm like, I'm okay. So that was probably why I was a, a butthead. But anyway, dude, you get a pass. You weren't a butthead. It's so amazing. <laughs> and here we are, twenty some years later, in the same town, hanging out. So that's cool. Thank you for coming on, everybody. Jason McGurr hanging out. Death Cab for having me Tim. and others. So thanks, man. And I'll see, you, uh, I'll see you around town. Oh yeah, for sure. And let's. Uh, we'll have to do this again. Cheers. Thank you, know, you very much, man. Yeah, happy hour. Visit herbsider.com. And uh, I'm drinking the 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 orange spice bourbon barrel. I got to try that one out right yeah, now. It's a special thing. We got certain can. Oh, I got to go. Six o'clock. Thanks, man. It's going to cut us off. Appreciate it. You're Bye. awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks for coming out, hanging out. We're going to get cut off here in any second. So thank you. Last week I wasn't able to come, but uh, thanks for coming now. Go to herbsider.com, man. We got some stuff up there. You don't even need your pants on. It comes right to your door.